okay, we are going to make a start. So welcome everyone to our special sea slug celebration webinar hosted by the Victoria National Park Association. Uh, my name is Nicole and I do have the pleasure of working for the VNPA and hosting tonight's event. Uh, we will go in search of sea slugs. Now, uh, we at the Victoria National Parks Association acknowledge the many first peoples of the area now known as Victoria and honour their continuing care for and connection to country. We support traditional owner joint management of parks and public land for conservation of natural and cultural heritage. We offer our respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. If you know, you might like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land you're tuning in from in the comments now. Uh, I'm joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. A little bit about us. Um, the Victoria National Park Association has been at the forefront of nature conservation for almost 70 years now. Uh, we share a vision of Victoria to have a diverse, healthy, natural environment protected, respected and enjoyed by all. Um, ReefWatch is kind of the marine citizen science baby of the VMPA. Uh, we've only been around for 15 years. Um, it is powered by the community and their love, knowledge and passion to learn more about Victoria's marine environment. And you're going you're gonna to see some of the people that um, really, really help keep everything going today. Uh, now this evening, we are going to be celebrating the success of a marine citizen science project that sees divers, snorkelers and rock pool ramblers from all around the country and even overseas take part. And it's what project that we're really pleased to be a part of. Um, first off, we're going to hear from one of the founders of the Sea Slug Census Project, uh, Professor Steve Smith from Southern Cross University's National Marine Science Centre. We've got a lot of um, uh, I guess acronyms and whatnot going on today, but we'll get through it. And also a lot of alliteration. So if I find myself a bit tongue twisted around sea slug census and whatnot, you'll just have to bear with me. Um, he's going to be sharing with us what he's learned about sea slugs um, over more than eight years. And I think it was over 60 censuses to date. Um, then we're gonna be hearing from a panel of our local legends, that's the divers, snorkelers and underwater photographers um, that turn their images into data for us every census. Uh, if you wanted to start searching for and snapping your own slug shots, um, these guys are a really great resource. So you're in luck tonight because our panelists will be sharing tips and tricks for finding and photographing slugs. Um, now before we start, I would like you to take a moment to think about your favourite Victorian nudibranch or other sea slug. Um, do you know what scientific name is the first question, which is a bit of a trick one, because <laughs> they do change a bit. Um, does your slug have a common name? Uh, most of them don't. Um, so maybe you only know your slug by a quick description that you give it or the colour or the shape. Um, perhaps you've named it yourself. So what I would like everyone to do is for a bit of fun, maybe just share your slug pseudonyms in the chat um, and see if we can get a consensus on some of our sensational census entrants. Um, the common names might stick around longer than the Latin names actually do. So for example, the one on our screen now, this colorful chromodorid, I've had more than one person tell me that they think it should be renamed the bubblegum slug. Now, once every speaker has finished, we'll have time for some questions and then we'll do a final round of questions at the end if we've got time. I do realize that we're, <laughs> we're trying to pack a lot in tonight, so I'm trying to move along quickly. We'll get there. So to kick things off tonight, we do have Professor Steve Smith, who among a great many other things, uh, is one of the founders of the Sea Slug Census. I'll let Steve introduce himself and his work. So over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Nicole. Thanks for that introduction. Um, uh, before I share my screen, I'll just give a little bit of a background. Yeah, I'm a, a professor of marine science. I've been in the game for, uh, well, too many years to count now. Um, I'm a very passionate malacologist, so I love all things to do with mollusks, but um, I guess it's the sea slugs that have captured my attention the most over the last decade. Um, and this is partly because we've got such a massive diversity in Australia and much of it is undescribed. And that was one of the motivations for starting the sea slug census program. But I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in terms of how it all started 
um, uh, as, as I start my presentation, which I'll do right now. Okay, so the Sea Slug Census Program, it actually started off um, back in 2013. I was doing a period of study leave, which is um, one of those academic privileges you get when you work in the university system sometimes. I was spending uh, about six weeks in Nelson Bay, Port Stephens, just north of Newcastle in New South Wales, and diving pretty much every day with uh, a couple of good friends. And we started this friendly rivalry to see who could find and photograph the most number of sea slugs. And after, after each dive, we'd sit down over a cuppa and, uh, and discuss what we'd got. We realised that we were so passionate about this and getting so much out of it that we thought lots of other people might want to get engaged with it too. Um, sometimes it's a bit of a long stretch to, uh, to put your uh, passions onto other people, but in this case, it, was, it, was, uh, it definitely happened. So Tom Davis and I, um, and I'll flick to the next slide, uh, here's Tom over here um, and Nicola um, approached uh, the president of the combined hunter underwater group and said, let's let's have a let's have a, a go and see if we can actually organize an event. And that was the first event back in December 2013. And from then it's gone from strength to strength. And as you can see, and I always like to start with the acknowledgements because uh, we usually run out of time towards the end of talks, and these are the most important people. Um, you'll see a couple of uh, familiar faces here, um, and we might start with them simply for the reason that we are um, addressing a primarily Victorian audience here. But uh, Cade and Nicole got on uh, board very early in the piece. Um, but I know we've got some of these other local organisers who do all the hard work um, on board. I know Julie sent a message through. Um, on the, on the chat just now, but these are our local organisers who do a lot of the behind the scenes um, organising, uh, send out all those communications to the local participants. And without them, um, we wouldn't have such a coordinated program. But I wanna run through a couple of other people. Um, I'm not a, a sea slug taxonomist or a taxonomic expert. I actually am much more interested in the ecology of sea slugs, but the ecology can only follow on when we actually know what species we're talking about. So clearly um, there's a necessity to engage in that sort of taxonomic quest um, so that we can drill down into that ecology later on. Um, but over here on the right hand side, we're very fortunate to have um, some uh, newer and some much older taxonomists who've been very, very important in helping us. Uh, Richard Willen, who was involved right at the beginning of the program and still involved with the sea slug centers on the Gold Coast. Bob Byrne, who is just an incredible man. I still haven't met him, but I'm gonna come down to Victoria just so that I can be, meet Bob. Um, he, he's, uh, he's legendary within the field of um, sea slugs. And in fact, my favorite sea slug, uh, which is Hancockia Burnai, um, is named after Bob. And more recently, Matt Nims, who joined the program probably around about 2015, um, has, has now completed his PhD on sea slugs, um, the sea hares, um, and is going to make a, a really important contribution uh, to the future of taxonomy um, of sea slugs in, in this country, for sure. Um, I want to make special mention to the four most, uh, I, I guess, our newest local organisers, uh, Christina Shur and Vanuatu, uh, Grace Keast, who's who'll be hosting another sea slug census this weekend in Exmouth and northwestern Western Australia. Um, Julie Schubert and Sabrina Velasco, they completed their sea slug census just a couple of weekends ago. All right, enough of that, but uh, thanks to everybody and in particular um, ahead of the whenever the, the Melbourne one will be to all those participants who uh, get very cold at this time of year diving looking for those sea slugs. So this is probably a bit of a no brainer, um, who are the sea slugs, but it's always a good idea just to quickly run through what we're talking about um, because the sea slugs are quite a varied, uh, it's quite a varied group when we talk about them as being the subclass heterobranchia, we've got to have some science here. Um, so part of the mollusks, the gastropods, and then the heterobranchs. And what we're talking about are the very obvious ones like the these sort of oval shaped ones with the rhinophores and the very obvious gills, which are the dorid nudibranchs. We have the aelid nudibranchs with these dorsal serrata. Um, and most of these feed on some kind of cnidarian like um, um, 
hydrozoans um, or soft corals in the case of the one up the top. Um, we have the, the dendronotids, we'd have these tree-like processes growing out of their dorsal, um, or their notum or their dorsal surface. And these are often mimicking their um, host. So the one at the bottom, for example, lives on a soft coral, which has polyps, which are almost, almost identical to that. And this one here is, is uh, Hancockia burnai, the one I mentioned just briefly uh, a minute ago. Um, the sea hares, which is Matt's group, uh, these are all herbivorous. So they, they feed on, on seaweeds. Um, all of these ones over here are carnivorous. Uh, the beautiful uh, bubble shells. Um, some of these are tiny. Some of them are much, much larger like this one, mostly foraging in sand and eating things like worms or very small invertebrates in the sand. Head shield slugs, which make a similar living. And again, uh, in incredibly um, colourful in terms of pattern. The sap sucking sea slugs, now there's a good tongue twister for you to go with the sea slug census, um, which have these stylet like mouth parts which they can insert into their algal food and suck out the juice. Um, the side gilled sea slugs, and you get some really interesting big ones down in Victoria. Um, and Last but not least, uh, the umbrella shells, and we only have um, we only have two species uh, within the east coast of Australia that we can see regularly. So why focus on sea slugs, um, and why have we sort of pursued this um, through the sea slug census program? Well, basically, they're a highly diverse group, and they're over three thousand now. Um, we get more and more every year, but three thousand described species, but probably that many and possibly more that are completely undescribed at this stage. So it's an under-researched group of organisms. Um, why I'm really interested in them is because they have great potential as environmental sentinels or um, environmental indicators, because most of them live for much less than one year. So you can get rapid turnover and most have very specific diets. And, and here's an example of one, uh, the blue dragon or Terre Lydia ianthina. And you can see here, it's clasped with these oral palps here. It's actually clasping this um, hydroid and eating that. This was at Nelson Bay. So because of these um, really specific diets, if their food disappears, then they disappear as well. So they respond very rapidly to changing environmental conditions. Um, we've already documented that in terms of climate change, where we've seen species moving south and quite rapidly moving south. Some introduced species which uh, um, have moved all the way from uh, southern Queensland right through to South Australia, for example, Sprilla brasiliana. But uh, generally speaking, we're getting more and more tropical species much, much further south in this, on the East Coast. The major challenge for looking at changes over time, though, is to have a reliable baseline. And really, what we used to know about uh, sea slugs was primarily confined to those major population centres. Um, or where people were doing specific research. And so the sea slug census program has given us the opportunity to gather a lot more information about the distribution patterns. So here's just an example. This is a paper that Matt and I published back in 2018. And it's showing these, the, the length of these lines here indicates um, the southward range extension that's occurred um, for, in this case, we documented 37 different species which had shifted south. And most of this data came from observations from sea slug census program. So the role for citizen science is a really obvious one because um, looking at the number of people who've tuned in tonight, you can tell that these uh, uh, sea slugs are incredibly popular with divers and rock pool ramblers. Um, if you jump onto social media, and I've got a couple of favorite sites that I go to like underwater macro photographers, 69,000 members, and you get almost a third of those images are of sea slugs, um, which is um, uh, which is a, a much higher representation um, when you look at in terms of the total percentage of marine species that could be featured. Um, but you've also got other places like Nudie Base, fantastic forum for getting identifications and discussing, and many other sites as well. So this is a potentially really important resource for documenting diversity and distributions too. And we've been looking at this quite a lot for generating um, regional inventories, which I'll talk about a little bit later. 
So back to the citizen scientists and what we did um, at Nelson Bay, we had our initial surveys we did every three months and we had scientists and um, volunteers all doing surveys at the same time over the uh, during the censuses. And we were able to look at um, address one of the questions which often comes up with in citizen sciences. Um, some of my colleagues have said, well, why would you do citizen science? Because you know, you're not going to get reliable data. And this was an opportunity to test that. We looked at a number of questions, uh, which are covered in a paper, which um, I can make available if people are interested. But basically, all I'm looking at here is, can citizen scientists um, provide an accurate snapshot of sea slug diversity? And these bars indicate the number of species found um, by scientists in the black and volunteers in the grey um, at each of the different censuses over this period of time, 13 censuses. The average was that volunteers found 89% of the species that scientists found, and that is a fantastic outcome. Um, there were lots of other interesting outcomes in that a single census uh, found as many species um, as four weeks um, of searching by scientists. So uh, this shows the efficiency and the importance of, uh, of citizen scientists in documenting species richness. We also gained some ecological insights, which we sort of had a, a rough idea about, but we got some fairly obvious patterns. This is for the chromodorids, which are primarily tropical in distribution. And we had these very obvious seasonal um, cycles of appearance and frequency of occurrence within Nelson Bay. So this is important ecological information, which I was particularly excited about. So, so far, I'm just gonna give you a quick summary now. We've done 66 surveys since 2013. And the map here is primarily showing these Southeast coast locations and the number of censuses. Eight in Melbourne, which is an amazing effort. Um, but we've also got a few off picture here like Northwestern, Western Australia, Vanuatu and Ambon. We've had 2,252 people who participated and they found between them 758 species, which is a massive effort. 311 of those species are single records. They've only been seen once. And 116 have only been found twice. And this really affirms the, the concept that sea slugs are rare in space and time. So quite often you'll find them on one occasion, you won't see them again for a long time. Um, and uh, you know that's one of the things I'm particularly interested in too, trying to explain those patterns. Um, in terms of range extensions, we've now got well over 60, and I haven't counted them all, but well over 60 species that have been recorded during this program as being well south of um, their known distribution ranges. So climate change is real and um, it's being felt by sea slugs. The most frequently cited species, and I'm sure these are gonna feature in some of the images by our um, subsequent speakers, um, but you know, up to 88% of censuses have found this particular, the clown nudibranch as it's sometimes called, or Ceratosoma amarinum. And this one, I'll just point out um, the small sea hare, uh, which has recently been renamed, or at least one of the types that we get along the east coast of Australia by Matt um, as the Plasia concava. And yes, the names change all the time and it's difficult for everybody to keep up, trust me. One of the really nice things about this program, it started off, as I said, as a, a bit of a, a, a sort of friends challenge um, and it's grown massively. Apart from this uh, obvious COVID related flat line here between 2019-20, we've had progressive increase in the number of venues and that's increasing all the time with um, very strong interest expressed by um, divers in Perth, Rottnest Island, Christmas Island, which is, sounds pretty cool, Fiji and Bali. And we, we're getting more and more inquiries all the time. Kate asked me to comment on in spe uh, specifically about what we do with the data because we are amassing quite a lot of data. Um, the number one priority is to provide educational feedback for all the participants. So we do that through the distribution or the compilation distribution of reports. And, and those who've participated in events before will have seen these, which we make quite widely available. 
We extract information for scientific publication because it's important we get this out into that sort of scientific community. It values citizen science um, and it really uh, pushes forward the concept of sea slugs as indicators of environmental change. Um, and one of my current projects, and I'll give you an example of this, is to um, basically develop a crowdsourced ID guide based on the images submitted. And um, that's going to be a fairly um, lengthy process, but I'm hoping that that can be sort of released as chapters for each family um, as, as we go along and then, and then uh, updated as, as we get additional species. And also so that we, um, I think there's, it, it's crazy to ignore the potential for an important portals like iNaturalist. And we're certainly exploring uh, the possibility of uploading images directly to iNaturalist as part of this process as well. These are just some examples of the papers that have uh, come out that are based on, at least in part, some of the citizen science uh, data. Um, and these include inventories. So we've got an inventory here of um, sea slugs of New South Wales and one of Lord Howe Island. This is based on not just the sea slug censuses, but those um, uh, information in books and also those uh, social media uh, sites that we were talking about. And we're working on one with Janine Baker at the moment for, um, we just started doing one for South Australia as well. This is uh, what I'm hoping to produce um, for everybody um, who participates. And this is basically trying to source images of species from every location. Um, and, you know, if we've got multiple locations with the same species, for example, Doto ostenta over here, um, trying to get as many of the sort of variations of that particular species um, depicted within these guides, because that's one of the hardest things um, is, you know, you get one image in a book and quite often there's a lot of variation around that. So uh, crowdsourced images to provide ID guides, um, which will be distributed uh, freely. The future. Well, the future is obviously looking at more venues and I'm getting very excited about where some of those might lead. Um, one of the issues with a program which has been fairly organic um, in the way it's evolved is um, sometimes you just got to uh, try and bring it in a little bit and standardize it so that we can conform to a standard approach, um, which will give us uh, a lot more opportunity to generate very specific data. One of the things I liked, and this was Cade's initial suggestion, I believe, was um, having a challenge month where we get as many venues as possible. And the March challenge, um, while it was fraught with difficulties for some groups with bad weather, um, it was incredibly successful. And we got seven locations all vying for the, um, the champion point score or species score for March. Um, and uh, Melbourne did particularly well uh, in that one, I believe. Um, <laughs> uh, standardized report format with peer review. I think uh, we've got some great data here. We do, sta as a standard, we get um, the species identifications checked and Bob does a fantastic job for Melbourne um, and we have, uh, but I think we want to extend that to, to make sure that every report we put out has been peer reviewed. And one of the other things I'm hoping to do in the not too distant future is get the organizers together and take some suggestions about how we can take this program forward. Importantly, one of the things that's come up time and time again is that we really don't um, know the names of a lot of these species because we don't have the taxonomic ability, um, not enough people working on these things within Australia. And some of the specimens that have been collected in the past are locked up in museums and not necessarily available. So what I'm really looking forward to trying to do is to work more closely with active taxonomists such as Matt to facilitate um, an advancement of knowledge about the Australian fauna. And one of the big things um, is, again, because it's been an organic process, is finding uh, a new primary host and sponsors for the entire program. We have sponsors for each of the different locations, but I think trying to get this onto a better footing um, for consistency in this realm as well would be very, very advantageous for the whole program. Okay, and I think um, 
I've probably gone over my 20 minutes, but um, that's where I wanted to leave it. And I'm happy to take questions, but I will just put this up for a little bit more information. The Sea Slug Census Facebook site is where we post most of our reports. They're also um, posted on the, the specific Facebook sites for each of the census groups. Um, but also these are where you can find those free downloads of, of the uh, illustrated guides to Lord Howe Island in New South Wales, if you're interested. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, yeah, really enjoyed learning a bit more about some of the other groups and seeing some of what's coming, what's coming up on the horizon, I guess. That was really great. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, I know you, you, know you talked about how you're an ecologist. Um, a lot of them are kind of taxonomy based. Um, one of the questions is, are sea slugs phylogenetically organized based solely on appearance? No, that's a nice simple question to start, start off with. One of the reasons that we're getting so much vari uh, variation and change in the species names, um, and even at the family level, um, is because uh, integrated taxonomy is now the way we do stuff. Uh, I say we, um, that's in a broad sense, I don't actually do this. Um, but yes, morphological variation is absolutely critical, and that's how all species were originally described based on their external and internal features. Um, so with sea slugs, it's the, the radula or the mouth part. It's also things like um, other, other internal organs. It's the external appearance, but increasingly it's, it's coming down to DNA as well. So when you're seeing um, species, uh, for example, the, the, the chromodorids with the big split within the chromodorids, and this is um, you know, Gonia brancus versus Chromodorus, um, um, Hypsilodorus versus Felimari, all these sorts of things have been related to um, the advances made through the genetic sequencing and using um, up to three or four different genes to try and differentiate between species and even deeper into that sort of phylogenetic um, order, look, getting down to, to families and beyond. There you go. Um, so we have had, there is one more question sort of around that kind of taxonomy thing, and that's basically sort of covered off on it, I think, but if you wanted to elaborate, just whether the pleurobranchs and the sea hairs fit in with sea slugs, because I guess that's one of the recurring questions is how do we actually refer to this group of not quite monophyletic animals? Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. And basically, um, we, we had to, you know, with the sea slug census program, it's probably worth taking a step back and saying, um, well, what do we include? And how can you convey that to people who might not be familiar with this? And we said, basically, as long as it looks like a slug, and it's a mollusk. Um, now, some groups include don't include bubble shells. Uh, so Nelson Bay in the original Nelson Bay series, anything with a visible shell was excluded, whereas all other groups do include that. Now, luckily, um, you know, there's not that many um, bubble shells in Port Stephens. We find them pretty much every time we go there anyway. So it's not, not a major oversight. Um, so yeah, look, it's, uh, we definitely include all slugs. And if, if people are in, in any doubt whatsoever, um, always send in the images and we can make that deliberation. We often get sea cucumbers, we often get um, sea hare turds, um, we get all sorts of interesting things that come through, but it, it keeps us entertained. Fair enough. I will ask one, uh, I guess, more ecology-based question for you <laughs> before we jump on to our next section. Um, and this one, look, it, it is a bit of a local question, um, but it's about, um, there is some, uh, kind of ur urchin decimation of seaweeds going on in one of our local marine sanctuaries. Um, and our, our question poster is just interested in whether or not um, there's, I guess, a lot of crossover with those kind of habitats with like seagrass and sea slugs and whether this kind of um, urchin barren will have an impact on their habitat as well. Absolutely. Uh, as, I, as I said right at the beginning, the uh, sea slugs are very specific um, in terms of diet. So if you lose a primary diet, so seaweed, for example, then you'll see a reduction in the sea hairs in particular. 
But also as a secondary effect, a lot of those tiny little nudibranchs like the botos that our next speakers are so good at finding live on the hydroids that live across the fronds or the laminae of those uh, large brown seaweeds. So we're not just losing primary food, but we're, using, we're losing habitat and secondary habitat. So absolutely it will have an impact on what you find in those environments, no question. Yeah, yeah. so there you go. So that's another yeah, it's a press, pressing issue that a lot of people are aware of. And yeah, yeah now if you, if you care about your, your sea slugs, then you should be interested in what's going on there too. So again, thank you so much, Steve. Um, to contribute to our census in July, all you have to do to submit any photos you take of sea slugs from anywhere in Victoria during that time. Um, some of you may have already been uh, considering yourself to be the quite the sea slug sleuth, um, but for many starting the search, it can be quite a challenge. So we thought we'd now hand it over to some of Victoria's top nudie enthusiasts, um, or nudie nerds as we like to call them, um, and they'll talk you through what they love about the search for sea slugs, uh, ways to find slugs, and how to photograph them. Uh, first up, I would like to hand over to Ian Shawley. So over to you, Ian. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nicole, and, and good evening to everybody. Um, um, so uh, to introduce myself, um, I um, am a, a long-term scuba diver, not um, a, um, a naturalist or an expert by any means, um, but um, almost from the first time I hit the water, um, some 25 years ago, uh, I've been fascinated by sea slugs. And um, I think um, um, finding them for me has become a little bit of an obsession. Um, I know that's, that's true of quite a few people. Um, and uh, I was pretty hopeless when I first started. Um, I know that because in my time in Victoria, uh, I've done many, many hundreds of dives um, and many hundreds of dives at my favorite nudibranch, Black, uh, nudibranch site, which is Blair, Gow Blair Gowry. Um, uh, and honestly, um, I did a lot of dives where I saw hardly any, uh, which when I look back on uh, things, kind of blows my mind a little bit now. Um, because uh, back in 2017, I, I decided that I would start to record what I was seeing there. Um, and um, I am now in that time up to nearly 120 species of sea slug at just Blair Gowrie, the one spot. Um, so what, what I'm aiming to do tonight, I suppose, along with, with some other people, is give you a few hits and tips. Um, how do you find uh, nudibrank, um, particularly when some of them can be really small? So here we go. Um, five tips from me. And I'm going to major on my fifth one, um, but to go through. Number one, and I and I really do think this is the most important thing, and the difference between finding them and not finding them, and that is you need to slow down. Um, and when I think back on my early dives, um, my focus was covering a lot of ground, um, seeing as much of the dive site as I could. Um, now. I can quite happily do a three and a half hour dive and not cover any more than 20 square meters. Um, so um, I think um, if you take anything away from me, slow down would be my thing um, because you're looking for small stuff. You really do have to look. Um, second thing, um, I think it's really helpful to know what other people are finding. And there's some great resources to do that. Um, um, we've already talked about the um, Nudibranch Victoria 
um, Facebook page. Um, every time I dive, as a for instance, I'm trying to put a, what I'm seeing onto that Facebook page um, because it helps to know what you're looking for. Uh, and I found that, um, you know, I found stuff simply because I knew what I was looking for. The third thing for me, um, I, I tend to dive a lot during the day and not so much at night. Uh, and a lot of these things like to hide during the day. Um, it doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, you just got to find them. And what I find is they're on the underside of things. So then, you know, they're more likely to be on the underside of the leaf of kelp, the underside of the sponge, the underside of the piece of wood. Um, what I would say uh, is if you're going to get into turning things over, you need to do it very carefully. Um, and you need to remember that they're hiding for a reason. So if you do turn things over to have a look, please make sure that you turn it back over when you're finished. My fourth tip uh, is think about camouflage. Um, a lot of these are trying not to be seen, which means that you're not necessarily looking for something that looks massively different from the um, surface that it's gonna sit upon. And then I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So my, my major tip, um, I think um, if you can take the time to do some research, my biggest tip would be if you can understand what the nudie branch is likely to be eating, it's far easier to find the food source than it is the nudie branch. But if you find the food source, you've got a good chance of finding the nudibranch that feeds on that food source. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a number of ways to find out what they're eating. Um, I think the pictures that we see are a good clue. Um, so look at what they're sitting on and you will start to see certain types of nudibranch sitting on the same types of sponge, hydroids, um, whatever else that they're, uh, they're sitting on. Another good clue, if you see the egg, um, the eggs of the nudibranch, um, they're laying their eggs on the food source. So again, if you're seeing eggs on something, keep looking. Sooner or later, you're going to find nudibranch on it. Um, there are some great then resources you can use. Um, I, I love Bob Burns book. Um, it's against every nudibranch. It has a, uh, a, it has a little section on um, you know, where you're likely to find them. And then there are some good websites out there. Um, I use the csubforum.net. Um, and also the Port Phillip Marine Life um, has a, a very good taxonomy kit um, that, again, tells you um, where it's known, what the food of each of the nudibranch are. I wanted then to wrap up just by giving you a few, um, a few pointers. Um, there, there is a, a pink thing going on. Um, we've got quite a few pink nudibranch in our, in our waters. If you find the pink sponges, um, then you're more than likely to find Nemea haliclona, uh, usually in large quantities. Um, and then every now and again, you'll find Nemea vaconis. Um, it, it even looks like the sponge. That it feeds upon. Um, remember, nudibranchs get their colour from what they eat. So if you want to find pink nudibranch, look for pink sponges. If you want to find orange nudibranch, 
look for orange sponges. So there's uh, four very, very easy to find orange nudibranch that I see almost every dive um, just because if I see an orange sponge, I immediately go over and I look for these. A um, couple more from me. Uh, this small little nudibranch, Chromodorus alternata, again, is at Blair Gowrie, especially in very large quantities. Uh, a lot of people don't see it, but if you can find black sponge, then more often than not, you're going to find this nudibranch. And then last, I'll give you the one that everybody, I think, will recognize uh, Tamia Vaconis. Um, always you find it on the blue green biozone. So, um, recapping then, most important slow down, take your time, really look. If you're swimming fast, you're going to swim past it. Yeah. Um, keep an eye on what people are seeing. Um, it's very easy then to go and look for specific examples. Um, underside of things rather than on top of things is really common. Um, and uh, this is a this is a real uh, test of whether I can remember my five. Um, the um, think camouflage. So think about things not wanting to be seen, and where they're how they're likely to achieve that. And then finally, if you can find their food, you should be able to find the new break. That's it from me. Um, without any further ado, we will jump over to Nick Shaw. So take it away, Nick. All right. So yeah, a little bit about me. Um, so I'm a, a high school teacher. Um, I'm very interested in all this kind of stuff in New Branks, marine life, uh, and also uh, life on the land, I guess, as well. Uh, I thought today, I, I do do diving as well, but primarily I do snorkeling. So I thought I'd try and focus on how to sort of increase your success in rock pools. So for me, <clears throat> uh, the Southern areas are much better. So anywhere sort of down here, uh, some of the better places would be, my sort of theory is wherever there's sort of currents dragging, I always sort of think of rock pools as almost like a graveyard for the nudibranchs. So like, where are the, where are the new, new branches getting washed into or where are they sort of getting dragged away by the current? So like obviously down near the entrance, there's a lot of the currents down there. Um, so any new branches that have been dislodged from their home, they could possibly be dragged and then washed into a, a rock pool or a reefy area down the bottom. So that's why Point Lonsdale, in my opinion, is really good and it changes all the time what's there. So the entrance is very close. There's some rock pools here. I haven't actually been out to this out a bit. It's pretty scary to get across this thing here. The current really gets through there. There's some reef down here near the pier as well. And there's some big rock pools actually on this um, outer reef. I've checked out the reef over here as well. That's not bad, but I've only seen the, uh, what is it? The Earth Colonia one. It's like the black with the orange little dots on the back of it. I really would like to check out down here. It's very hard, obviously, to get to. You'd have to walk about 45 minutes through the quarantine station to get down there. Some other places that have been good. I've read a lot about San Remo being really good. I've, I've gone snorkeling there three times and almost got dragged out to the to Bass Strait. The currents there are so nuts. Um, there's I've tried down here as well. Again, I was thinking with the same sort of theory, currents from Western Port, what are they sort of done a dump down here into the reefs down here? I, so last census I tried down here, it was pretty good. Um, I've read down here is pretty good, but I've only tried on the mushroom reef side. The time I went there, it wasn't the best weather though. So I can't really say it wasn't the best, but in general, sticking down the South way more, I've gone snorkeling at the top a lot, but to be honest, the only one I found there is the big uh, 
forgive my pronunciation, a lot of these things I've just read in books. Uh, serostoma brevicordatum, whatever it is. That really big one looks like a chorizo. Uh, obviously, one sort of spot I'm starting to go to more now is Sorrento Back Beach. So there's the big car park there. There's a really sort of big, deep rock pool here. And then there's another huge one here, which you could spend hours and hours in trying to find them. It's almost too big. There's some down here I'd really like to try out as well. But obviously the best time to go is low tide because uh, that's when, it, again, it's just my theory. So when the waves have washed all the nudibranchs into here, then they've sort of settled down. Um, and then you can have a look through the kelp for them. Uh, so back when I started, similar to Ian, when I started out, I actually took me a long time to see my first one. I think my first one was the clown nudibranch one. Um, and then for the, like the next sort of six months or so, I could only find the big ones. And when I first saw my first small ones, about the size of a thumbnail, I finally went, holy moly, is that how big they are? And so that's what really started to get my eye in. Back when I started as well, I used to not wear a wetsuit. So I would only go in hot weather. Um, so to me, like a blue sky, a sunny day, perfect place would be to go to something like this. So that's, this is Sorrento Back Beach. Um, so there's a big pool there, big pool there. But this gets my next sort of point with rock pools. It's better, rock pools be really harsh. So when, when you're diving, the sunlight and things are not as harsh. And you can tell that when you're down because the colors are different. But in rock pools, they're really exposed. So I always, always think, think like a garden snail. If it's good garden snail weather, it should be good for um, sea slugs. So I've gone snorkeling quite a lot at mm -hmm. night lately, mainly because I've got young kids and stuff. So it's hard for me to get out, but I actually find it kind of relaxing. Um, so night, it's a bit crazy, but yeah, it's definitely doable. But conditions like this, like a foggy sort of calm morning, so you can see this reef here at Point Lonsdale. So if you have a look around here, you should be able to find some things. But this sort of conditions, like you can picture slugs and things coming out in your garden. So if that's the case, it'll be easy to find. They'll be on the, more likely be on the top side of kelp. Um, so this is one I found a couple of cents ago. A little, again, never actually said this out loud. Genulus, 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 whatever. Um, found this guy on some kelp. I was trying to take a photo with a light. And as I tried my light, I started to get cranky with me and then just sort of dove off the edge of the kelp. So these things, in my experience, nearly all of them really hate sunlight or in this case, a torch. So dawn and dusk have been really good. Dawn's nice because you can sort of get there and then it sort of gets gradually lighter. Uh, it's just general, in, when you're in the rock pool itself, some are much easier to find. So some of the ones, the aeola ones, they kind of move around a bit faster. So the ones with the little sort of, what are they called again? Serrata on their back. Um, so they move around faster. So they, they're more likely to be on the top of the kelp and the bottom because they move around so much. Little polycera like this, sometimes they'll just hang out on the edge of, um, of the kelp. So either, I'm, I don't know what they're doing, maybe they're sensing with their rhinopores or their, I don't know, I don't actually don't know what these things eat. So maybe they're eating, I don't know. Um, but like some days, some days it is a bad day. So like a bad day for me in a rock pool would be maybe one in an hour or even none. But like when it's a good day, but basically when you get in there, there's so many in that rock pool that you should find one within five minutes. And then once you go in, sometimes there's just so many in there and you find them every few minutes. And that could be different species or the same one. Okay. Oh yeah. And you're sort of looking for what not, what does not belong. With um, if it's nice weather, like Ian saying, like if they've been washed into the rock pool and it's a sunny day, they're more likely to crawl around to the bottom of the kelp. So you might have to lift the kelp and see if there's anything under there. So this is one that like a, a little, uh, what is it, Doris Cameroni. So that was on the underside of the kelp. And then as soon as I saw it on the other side, it started crawling straight away to get back um, away from the sun. Uh, and there's a little, Oh, I forget that one. It's got to change its name, C. Poenica or something. Um, but that one you can see is sort of, once it's been exposed to the sun, it starts to sort of get right back down into there. Some of them tiny. So this, you can see this rock pool I was in, it had some waves crashing into it. That's why there's all these little sand and stuff everywhere in the water. That's a little dodo ostenta. So they're tiny things. So, so that's my thumb. So you can see how small it is. Um, 
And so with kelp like this, generally because it's rough, there's not much stuff on it. So if there is something on it, it's more likely it could be something interesting. So it could be a nudibranch or a sea spot or um, one of those little crustacean things that you can see there. Um, so like sometimes I, they're too small and you can't actually tell what they are. So I just tend to take photos of anything I think is a sea slug. Sometimes I'll zoom in my camera and try and find out if it is. So if you look at these three, see if you can have a guess which ones are nudibranchs, which ones are not. Let me give you five seconds. So I tried to zoom in a bit. It's a little coralline algae. Uh, that's the middle one, nudibranch. And I think that was just a little bit of fish poo. But from a distance, that looks really like a nudibranch. It's got its nice curve to it, kind of getting sort of like a nudibranch shape. So it could be exciting if you see that from a couple of meters away, but when you get closer, you're like, ah, fuck it. It's not a nudibranch. And that's quite interesting, this one, how it's trying to maybe through natural selection, similar shape. So my general summary for rock pools, low, low tide obviously is the best because then you can get the pools that are, have had nudibranchs and other creatures washed into them. Um, down the southern part of the bay, southern part of Western Port are the best, or even on the um, Bass Strait side as well. Uh, I think dusk and dawn are probably the best. Night is a little bit crazy. Gloomy weather is really good. So like a day like today would have been amazing. Um, if it's a nice sunny day, you might have to get the kelp and sort of have a little look under it. Sometimes it's a bad day, so you just got to persist a bit. Um, and then as you've been doing it more and more, you get your eye in and you start finding um, more and more interesting ones. So that's it for me. All right, thank Nick. thanks Nick. Um, and yeah, look, I think <laughs> someone's mentioned um, we should all take a Latin course. Uh, look, you know, yeah, I think no. <laughs> most most of us here, um, yeah, we're seeing these names in books, and it, you're it's just about having having a good old crack at pronouncing it. I think one. you did well. Oh, I would have said Janalis. Janalis. <laughs> but I guess Steve can <laughs> tell us whether we're wrong later. Um, all right, <laughs> thanks, Janalis. Nick. Our next panelist is going to be um, Holly Baird. So over to you, Holly. Great. Okay. Hi, I'm Holly. I live in Marlow in the far, far east of Victoria. And um, I'm a super enthusiastic um, amateur diver and nudibranch hunter. I'm not a marine scientist or anything like that. I'm just a uh, scuba diver with a camera. So um, I'm just going to have a little bit of a chat about the nudibranchs that we find here um, east of Lake Centrance. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm based in Marlow. Our local dive sites are um, at Cape Conran, which um, I guess maybe some of you have dived at before. And if you haven't, I highly recommend it. We've got a, um, a, a like a vast array of different different habitats that are all um, all got a little bit of something different. Our local marine sanctuary is uh, Beware Reef. Marine Sanctuary, which is about three kilometres off the off the beach here at Cape Conran. Um, it's sort of at the confluence of the East Australian Current and uh, Bass Strait, if that makes sense. And so there's a lot of um, quite unique species and, and habitats out there. And also we dive a little bit at Malakuta when we can. And Gabo Island is our nudie hunting hotspot there. So. Um, yeah, so there's lots of lots of spots to dive and plenty of slugs to find. And I'm just going to run through a few um, a few of our our favourites. Our um, we have Hypsilodorus benetti, which uh, we call him our house nudibranch. He's again, I I've only read these names in books. I don't have a Latin speaking background, so um, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation. I hope I've got him right. Um, we call this one our house nudibranch. We find it on almost every dive and in, in lots of uh, different different spots around, especially around Cape Conran and at Beware Reef. Got some um, some fun pictures here of, I think, I think he looks like he's making a speech, the one on the left, uh, and a mating pair and yeah, a couple of examples. So that would be our most uh, common nudibranch here in the East. Easy, easy to spot because it's got a beautiful bright color and it's a medium size, maybe 30 to 40 millimeters long. So that's a fun one to find here. Uh, this big, 
big yellow meaty one is, um, as far as I know, an undescribed species. And I call him Aphelodorus species RB1 because that is what my book says. I think that it, it has different names depending on uh, which paper you read and which book you have. Uh, he's, he's very common around Cape Conran in here um, and out at Beware Reef. I think this one was actually originally found by the Friends of Beware Reef group who were a, um, they're a local um, citizen science group. And I think that they were the first ones to find this and it's uh, still yet to be described. Again, an easy one to find because it's quite big, 70 to 80 uh, millimeters in length. And it's a big peachy yellow color with uh, purpley brown rhinophores and gills. And uh, there's just some examples there of, um, on the left is just a, a regular Aphelodorus RB1. And on the right, um, I think the one at the top looks like it's, you might be able to see, it looks like he's had his gills perhaps nibbled by a fish. And the one on the bottom right is a, a funny, I guess a congenital defect. This one's got the two rhinophores coming out of the one pocket. Maybe if someone could pop some comments about, about that one. I don't, I don't really know what's going on there. I just thought it was interesting and popped him in. Uh, we also find quite a lot of, um, again, Ceratosoma aemonum, uh, a really striking and a fairly large nudibranch, maybe around 40 to 50 millimetres long, so it's quite easy to spot. Uh, some examples there of um, Ceratosoma aemonum. Uh, we often find this one, yeah, in, in all of our dive sites, again, so he's a, a fairly a fun one to find. Do I think that in Port Phillip Bay and definitely around Port Welsh Pool, where I've dived before, the Ceratosoma brevicordatum is, is super common and it's a pinky color there. Um, I read in my book that it's Victoria's most common large nudibranch, but we don't find it that commonly here um, in the East. Uh, I think what's interesting about this one for me is that here in the east there are some color variations uh, compared to what's what we're seeing in Port Phillip Bay. Uh, the one in the picture I found at Gabo Island and it's a quite a purpley darkish color. I think the guys who are finding them down there more regularly think they're gray. Um, and at Cape Conran often it's a more uh, peachy color rather than the than the red color so thought that was a, an interesting point of note. Uh, this one I've only found a couple of times around uh, Gabo Island and Malakuta. When I've tried to research which species this one is, um, the best I could come up with was that it's Aphelodorus luctuosa, which is commonly found in New Zealand. I'm not sure how often it's been recorded here in Australia but apparently the uh, yellow rhinophores and gills are characteristic for this species. So I thought that was an interesting one to pop in. Now, I'm, I'm not sure how to say this, but I'll give it a go. Uh, Terriolidia ianthina, I believe until recently, he was um, believed to be restricted to the Sydney area but the, um, we found this one quite a few times at Gabo Island and around Malakuta. I haven't seen it yet at Cape Conran or Beware Reef. And um, this one is, it's also called the blue dragon, I guess, because it's of its shaggy bright blue appearance. And it's super interesting because it has symbiotic zooxanthellae, again, pronunciation, not sure but that allows the nudibranch to uh, harness the energy from the sun to produce its own food. So it's basically a solar powered slug, which is pretty exciting. Uh, found once only at East Cape Conran. This one's a, um, he's a definitely a construction worker nudibranch with high vis, um, Diversidorus sulfurea. Just threw him in for a bit of a bit of a variation incredibly cryptic. I've only found this one three or four times. I believe that it's reasonably common that um, um, he eludes us often, very cryptic. This is Australis ornata. So I found this one further east. So down at Pearl Point, which is almost to Point Hicks from here. So further east towards Malacuta, 
Anna found him at Malakuda and at Gabo Island. Uh, quite tricky to see, and when I have observed it, it's because it's been moving from A to B and not not just sitting still. So that was how I picked up the the um, the tentacles and the and the rhinophores moving across the reef. Otherwise, quite tricky. Um, I guess you can see from these examples that it's it's fairly well camouflaged, whatever whatever the substrate. So that was um, a fun one to throw in. Uh, this is one of the tiniest nudibranchs I've ever managed to take a photo of, Trapania brunia, a teeny weeny little nudibranch. I think he only gets as big as 10 millimeters long and he looks a bit like cookies and cream to me. Um, the day that I took this photo, I was so proud of myself because I've found this teeny weeny nudibranch and managed to um, get a photo of it while completely missing out on the whale that swam right over my head. But um, I've still got a nice nudibranch photo for it. And, uh, and my last example that uh, I've got here from East Gippsland is Vaconia closiorum. I've only found this one once out at Beware Reef. Again, another high-vis one, and I think it's slightly different to what's in the books. The, um, the examples I've seen when I've been researching have been a darker, more brownish color, and this one was a red, a very bright um, high-vis yellow. So it's quite easy to spot sitting out on the reef. Um, and I managed to snap a little picture of it. So that is a crash course on the uh, the nudibranchs here in East Gippsland. I hope you've um, all enjoyed. Thanks, Ali. And yeah, I do think a few of us, especially those of us that are normally stuck in kind of the centre of the state, have some questions around where to where to go. So we'll we'll keep an eye on that. Um, so thanks again, Holly. Um, our last panelist for the night, um, last but not least, because she is our ultimate nudie hunter um, with the record for most species spotted during a census, and that is Rebecca Lloyd. So over to you, Bex. Thanks so much, Nicole. Awesome. All right. So again, thanks for that, Nicole. My name is Rebecca, and I am a avid scuba diver, and I wanted to learn photography, and nudies don't move very fast for the most part. And they were my subjects whilst I was learning to take photographs. And before I knew it, it was about the only thing that I wanted to take a photograph of. And so that's pretty much where my love of nudies came from. And now it is pretty much an obsession. Um, and I'd also like to thank Steve. There's been so much really interesting science um, information has been talked about tonight and my fellow nudie hunters with all their ideas they're definitely going to help me I'm really excited about the East Gippsland slugs because I'm currently in Bamsdale so I'm definitely going to spend some time in the water very soon probably even this weekend fingers crossed but I do apologize for everyone who may not be able to get to the water for my excitement there. Um, this quick picture here is one of my favorite nudibranchs. It is a genalis species, the same one that I believe Nick showed a picture of. And everyone's already stolen my joke about not speaking Latin. So I'll just join, join with everyone else and say, I say the words exactly as they're written, very phonetically. So I'll probably also get it wrong as well. Um, my top five tips include research and slowing down, which we've already heard a bit about, but it is two of my, my top tips. So I'll touch on them really briefly, but then go on to talk about some of my other tips, which includes spending time on the sea floor, getting out at night, um, and also strangely enough, don't look for a slug. This is a picture here of Trepania brunier, which you can also see those little black dots all over the orange sponge. That's its food source and they're called nodding heads. So if you can find those little black nodding heads on a sponge, then that's going to increase your chances of also seeing one of our trepanium species here. So I'll just talk again about research and slowing down. Exactly um, as Ian had said earlier, um, doing our research and understanding the possibilities of what you can see is really going to help you. So that means learning the species that we have, what they eat, and also what their eggs look like. And because that we do have so many small sea slugs here in Melbourne and Victoria, that really means you do have to slow down to, to increase your chance of seeing them. So searching a small area 
will provide you a better outcome than having a quick glance across an entire dive site. Uh, this trinchesia that I've put a picture up here is a really great um, small nudie branch that people can see and that's because it's really accessible. Um, you can see it both snorkeling and scuba diving in the shallow waters around Blegowrie and Rye between September and November every year. So they uh, live their adult life on tiny little hydroids which grow up out of the sand. They look like a little pink flower and they eat those and they lay their eggs there. So when September comes around, if you can get out into the shallows there, you only need to go into two or three feet depth of water and you might be able to find a new species, which they're only about uh, one centimetre. So you do have to look, but um, that's just a, a quick specific one that you might be able to get out and see. So I like to talk about spending time on the seafloor. Some of us perhaps are looking at our sites at uh, larger structures or on the pylons of piers and things like that, but we can't ignore the seafloor because that's where you might find a lot of our nudibranchs. Um, sites like Blair Gowry and other areas, they collect debris such as corals, weeds or sponges in the sandy hollows out of the current. And these areas become something like a miniature oasis where many nudibranch will gather. So you definitely want to be looking at those areas. This Ercolania boule was something that I saw, it was in broad daylight crawling over the sand, heading in towards one of these um, protected areas. I'm pretty sure I just completely ruined that name there and there'll be scientists cringing, but that's okay. As you can see from the picture, it's only about the size of a grain of rice. So difficult to see if you are swimming quite quickly in that area. Um, we'll keep going. So one of my big tips is if you can get out at night, as we've already heard from, from Nick and, and Ian may have mentioned as well, um, a lot of our nudibranchs don't like light. So you'll absolutely find more nudibranchs and other slugs if you can get out at night time than you would during the day. Um, you need to wait until at least an hour after the last light before you hit the water because the longer into the night time that you can wait before going out, the more activity you're likely to see there. And another tip if you are going out at night is if you can, is would be to have a red light. That's because as, we, as we've mentioned, a lot of these animals are really light sensitive. So as soon as you see them and shine a torch on them, they have a tendency to run away. But if you can switch to a red light, um, it doesn't affect them as much, which gives you more opportunity to actually see them and, and observe them. I'll just quickly note that, of course, going at night time in the ocean can be a bit more dangerous. So make sure that you uh, adhere to all your safety precautions when you're getting out. This picture here is a Polycera species. It's unnamed. That's the little sort of pinky orange bit in the middle of the bry bryozoan. Um, these bryozoans are a food source for a lot of nudibranch, including the Janalus species that we've seen a couple of times tonight. Janalus are very light sensitive and they're one of the species that will run away very quickly as soon as a bit of light is put on them. Um, but you have a much better chance of seeing something like that if you can get out at night time. My last tip, and it sounds pretty strange, is don't look for the slug. As we've already heard, I think everyone's mentioned something like this tonight as well, is that you may not see the, the sea slug, but you might see other things associated with them. So for myself, when I'm looking, I'm looking for a shape because most sea slugs share one of a few different body shapes. So if you can train your eyes to learn what those shapes, shapes are, then when you're searching, you can find the shape and then fill in the colour or the patterns and things like that afterwards. Definitely you need to look twice at odd things out, strange blobs or flecks of bright colour have a good chance of being what you're looking for, but it could also be fish poo. Yeah, unless you look twice, you won't know. And the last but not least definitely is quite often you'll see eggs or evidence of feeding before you see the sea slug. So this top picture here 
is a name I'm not going to say the whole thing, but it's a Rostanga species. And you can see on the sponge how there's smooth areas and then really rough areas, which I believe is um, areas where the animal's been feeding. And then you can see the circular um, outline of the animal in the middle. So that's combining some of these ideas together. And the bottom picture is a Eubranchus species. It's about five millimetres long, but I saw this white fleck just hovering and it didn't look like it should be able to hover there and not drift away in the current. So I had a second look and I was really excited to find that one. The last thing I'll share is an example of seeing egg masses, which led me to see this Eubranchus species, which is quite rarely seen. And it was the first time that I'd ever seen it as well. So I was diving um, off the boat doing Lonsdale Wall and the site was covered with these brown hydroids that essentially look like little shrubs, but every single one of them was covered in white flecks like snow. And when I looked at them, it was all eggs, thousands of them over the site. And so that sort of was an indicator for me to look closer. And when I used my torch, I was able to highlight a really small uh, sea slug that was hiding in the depths of, of those hydroids. So um, I suppose I'll finish there and just say, you know, all these signs and indicators um, are what you need to look for and will quite often lead you to seeing the slugs themselves. Fantastic. Thank you, Max. Um, all right, so we will have a little bit of time for questions. I know we're over. Uh, I don't know why we set ourselves these like hour time limits because we never, never hit them. Um, so <laughs> if you do need to go and have dinner or put the kids away or whatever, just um, yeah, feel free to tune out. But if you are going to stick around. We will have a couple of questions. Um, I think we'll start off with, I did see a question. Um, someone wants to know whether the VMPA has rulers we can use taking photographs. Um, we don't. I have seen that there is a suggestion to use one of those aluminium sort of poking sticks. Does anyone else have a good um, suggestion for how to get like scale into your photo if you want to kind of say, hey, I found this new bank and it was like, it's big. Any of our panelists? Plastic rulers are quite useful. Um, you can fit them in your pocket and um, even just a, a small piece of one uh, will give it a little bit of a scale bar. Fantastic. The other one I would say, because I do see a lot of photos, <laughs> obviously, uh, is you can always just use your thumb. I know my thumb's a bit smaller than some people's thumbs, um, but, you know, worst, worst case scenario, you can kind of just hover your, your thumb next to the needy bank, try not to touch them. Um, but that will give you a bit of an idea of what kind of scale, and especially because we know that a lot of those nitties are, you know, the size of like your pinky fingernail. So that would be a couple of suggestions there. Um, what else we got? Um, look, we have had a few people ask for a few more details around some of the dive sites um, in the east. Holly, would you be comfortable if I, if people email me if they're interested and I can kind of hook you guys up and you can talk about some locations? Fantastic. Uh, what else have we got? <laughs> back, to, back to phylogeny. Is there a phylogenetic tree of sea slugs in Australia that we can all agree on? Um, Australia is part of the, well, the slugs in Australia are all part of the, the global one. And judging by the debate that is ongoing about various different groups all the time, I would say I've got Buckley's chance of getting 100% agreement anytime soon. Um, different people using different methods and different interpretations. Um, and hopefully this sort of concept of integrated taxonomy, once we can establish the ground rules um, about making decisions might help. But then again, um, the history of this isn't good. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, all right, so we've got one last question in the QA. Um, it was just that, does anyone else have any location tips for snorkelers across Victoria? So I guess we're thinking of places a bit further outside of the bay. So if any of our panelists, um, and that's even if Nick's been any other places you forgot to mention, um, any, any other locations for snorkelers? Yeah, I've been here. <laughs> I've tried to always go everywhere. I, um, if you can bother driving to Portland, like Portland Breakwater is pretty cool. There's some weird like um, 
uh, sort of cold ones that can come from South Australia. There's this weird sort of orange white one. I want, I want to see that one. I haven't seen it. But like I reckon Phillip Island, that's that's pretty far from Melbourne. It's like at least two hours. And there's so many different places around there. That Kitty Miller Bay is apparently really good. I've only been there once. And then around the other side, it's a bit calmer. Depends on the wind and stuff. But yeah, I reckon Phillip Island's definitely worth a shot. Yeah, I second Phillip Island. There's some some safe places such as um, Red Rocks Beach as well. Just being careful there with there's a lot of currents. So if you somewhere like San Remo, it could be quite dangerous. And even around the Cows Jetty, if you were to go there, um, you'd need to go at slack water as the currents there are also very strong. Yeah, fantastic. And there was another uh, in the chat, we've also had a mention of Warrnambool. So there are, yeah, there are plenty of places, but um, I guess as some of our panellists have mentioned, obviously conditions can be um, pretty important to monitor and you're obviously going to want to be diving or snorkeling to your ability. Um, well, we, do we have one more question? No, that's it. All right, so I think we might say, <laughs> we're nearly 20 minutes over. Uh, <laughs> I might say thank you again, uh, everyone, for joining us, and a uh, huge thanks to our, um, our little, I guess, um, Zoom fairy Kate in the background that's been keeping everything running all this time. Um, again, I wanted to thank um, particularly you guys, all the hundreds of nudie nerds who get out there and search for sea slugs every census, and they're helping gain, uh, helping us all gain a much a much greater understanding of the biodiversity of these um, really fantastic mollusks. Um, so we do appreciate every single image you share. Uh, it really is the highlight of my job. and I'm, I'm always really excited to be able to pass them on to Steve as well. And yeah, we look, we do um, talk about how impressed we are with everybody. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Um, really the dedication from this community is, is quite heartwarming. Um, I would also like to thank any of our VMPA supporters and donors that have tuned in tonight. Um, the VMPA is a small organisation and we work collaboratively with a lot of different groups um, and most importantly um, with the community in an ongoing effort to ensure that Victoria's natural assets um, can be enjoyed now and protected for future generations. Um, so your support does mean the world to us. Um, if you would like to get more involved or are able to support us, that would be amazing and greatly appreciated as well. Um, so I hope everyone had as much fun as I did listening to all of our fabulous speakers tonight. Um, I really look forward to checking out all of your snaps um, in the coming weeks, especially around our census time. Um, for now, take care of yourselves. Um, take care of your, your loved ones. Um, hang in there, Melbourne in particular, but Victoria in general. Um, and, yeah, I, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening. That's it from me.